Usually here on the show, we talk about normal things like 9mm and 45 ACP. Well, today, we're talking about the eight weirdest cartridges you've never heard of. Hello, friends and lovers. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Chris, like you said in our intro, we usually talk about ammunition that people should actually buy. Yeah. Today, we're going to talk about weird stuff that we're never, ever, ever going to offer for sale on Ammo.com. And most of it is just weird novelty stuff that wildcatters kind of invented so they can laugh about it. No, Dave, you're absolutely right. And uh, if you like buying ammunition online, make sure you click that link down in the description of the pinned comment. Get your free $20 off coupon for ammo.com. But today we are dedicating it to the wildcatters, like you said, those weird cartridges that, man, you've got to pay a ridiculous amount to get if you can even find the ammunition for it. So, uh, Dave, what's the first one we're going to talk about today? The first one is always interesting to me because uh, the most important thing is what it's not. This is the 9mm Flaubert. This is a rim-fired primed shot shell. So to be sure, the same kind of technology that ignites your 22 lr but it's a shot shell. It was introduced around the turn of the century by Louis-Nicolas Flaubert, the inventor of the first metallic rim-fired prime cartridge, no less. This thing is tiny. It is anemic. Do not use it in a gunfight. It fires a one-quarter ounce of shot at a muzzle velocity of about 600 feet per second. Now, the 9mm Flaubert is interesting because it's so weak that European governments don't even care if their subjects have it. It's uh, it's effective about 20 yards. You can use it indoors. Yeah, that is, uh, that's that's pretty much the definition of an anemic cartridge there. We, we talk about that you know, that nasty word stopping power sometimes here on the show, and uh, this has none of it, it sounds like. Man, this that is a very light round, to say the least. Now, this next one we've got is not light at all. Now, what if I told you there was a bullet in the Civil War that was hexagonal in shape? Uh, now, this is one you don't hear about every day. This is the Whitworth sniper rifle. Now, these are incredibly rare and incredibly expensive if you find them. But uh, he developed this rifle uh, between 1854 and 57. The gentleman's name was Sir Joseph Whitworth. And he basically was the innovator of what we now refer to as polygonal rifling. Uh, it's very common today in like Glock and H and K pistols, but back in the day, it was something very new where we just had traditional, you know, cylindrical rifling to help stabilize the full lead bullets. He initially developed it for artillery, but decided to make a rifle with it. And not only did he make the the bullet hexagonal, it basically doesn't spin in the barrel. It mechanically fits down into the barrel. Uh, so that you have that nice tight seal without having to basically gyroscopically stabilize the bullet. It may sound counterintuitive, but this was perhaps one of the most accurate muzzle loaders ever made. They reported that Whitworth rifles were capable of maintaining sub-MOA levels of accuracy at 500 yards, which, if you know muzzle loaders, is an incredibly huge feat to say the least. Now, the downside of this, what seems like amazing technology, was that it was about four times as expensive to produce back in the day. And so very interesting, innovative technology, but uh, yeah, sadly, way too expensive and maybe a little bit before its time. Now, what's the next one you got for us, Dave? Well, Chris, I like the incredibly weak, the uselessly weak cartridges. So I had to go with the two millimeter Colibri. That's right, the two millimeter uh, Colibri is the German word for hummingbird. The entire cartridge weighs only 82 grains, which wow. means that there's heavier 380C bullets than this entire cartridge. It fires a three grain full metal jacket. Its velocity is 660 feet per second, uh, which, you know, it's not, it's not horrible, but its muzzle energy is three foot pounds. Three? <laughs> three. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Three foot pounds. Chris, I've seen videos of people like shooting apples with this thing, and it, and it goes about an inch into the apple. But believe it or not, it was marketed as a self defense cartridge. You were instructed to shoot the person in the face if you actually used it. It, it disappeared when World War I broke out, presumably because that's when every European got a front row seat to what a handgun should actually be able to do. But uh, gosh, if you thought the 25 ACP was too little for self defense, then. 
look out, here comes a two millimeter Colibri. Yeah, that that's pretty wild. But guys, I've got one that you're definitely going to want to use for self-defense. And that one is Dragon's Breath, which is a t- specialty 12-gauge shotgun shell. Now, I don't know about you, Dave, but I've always wanted to have a flamethrower. It just seems cool to, you know, just walk out your front door with the flamethrower on. The thing is, yeah, you can buy them, but they are ridiculously expensive. So, you know what isn't expensive? That would be a 12-gauge shotgun and a couple rounds of Dragon's Breath. Now, these rounds are loaded with basically magnesium pellets, so you're going to need to make sure you clean your shotgun out really well after this. Clearly, this is marketed for self-defense, especially inside the home. Seems like a great idea. You can totally burn the house down around the potential home invader. Awesome choice. No, guys, don't use it for home defense. All right, what's the next one you got? uh, This one was a new one to me. The point eleven millimeter what's it? It's wow. a wild crack cartridge created by opening up a shotgun primer to accept a single number sh- uh, six birdshot projectile. That's right, a single point eleven inch diameter two grain ball of lead. This thing is so weak it doesn't even have propellant. Uh, propulsion is solely provided by ignition of the shotgun primer itself. It's basically a shotgun primer with a little ball bearing on the end. But hypothetically speaking. The 11 watts, it would have a muzzle energy of about 16 foot pounds, which means it's not even the weakest cartridge on our list. But don't, don't go looking for this one. It was basically created as like a joke by a wildcatter. No firearm has ever been chambered for it. And you're probably better off just spitting at anything you want to shoot anyway. Guys, if you have the need for speed, you are going to love this next cartridge on our list. And it has to be perhaps the best named cartridge that we've got. It is the 22 ear splitting Loudon Boomer. <laughs> yeah. Made by none other than Parker Ackley. But he made this one kind of as a bit of a novelty round for Bob Hutton, who wrote for Guns and Ammo magazine. And he basically wanted to push a 22 caliber tr- projectile upwards of 5,000 feet per second. Now, he made the ear splitting Loudon Boomer. Don't want to get that wrong. Yeah, uh, by necking down a 378 Weatherby Magnum case. Now, if you know Magnum cases, that that's pretty big. Uh, it's a big boy. He stuck a 50 grain, 22 caliber bullet on it, similar to what you can use in an AR-15. Didn't quite make it to the 5,000 feet per second. Made it to about 4,600 is what they could catch on the chronograph, but uh, still about 400 feet per second faster than the 220 Swift, the 22 250, and it's coming in right around Mach 4. So if you ain't wearing ear pro when you fire this thing off, you're going to be yelling ear splitting loud and boomer when uh, you go to the audiologist. Uh, But Dave, you've got a pretty cool one here that takes cartridge development uh, a little bit of a different direction. Yeah. Um, This one is odd. The Gyrojet is essentially a little rocket launcher that fires adorable little rockets called microjets. It was introduced during the 1960s. It had some some kind of cool advantages, the benefits of shooting literal tiny rockets. There's virtually zero recoil. Uh, the rifle didn't need a heavy barrel to contain so much chamber pressure, so it could be extremely light. And it could even fire underwater, which was a huge advantage if you like swimming in a public pool in rough neighborhoods. <laughs> but the 180 grain microjet rocket actually held enough fuel to break the speed of sound, but it required about 60 feet in order to get to the max velocity. And it wasn't very reliable. You could still buy these things, like they're not that old and they weren't incredibly rare. You can get a common one for about $2,500, hmm. but is a single microjet rocket usually costs over $100. Oh my and gosh. And I don't think ammo.com is going to start selling microjets anytime soon. Guys, this one, if you want to talk about novelty rounds, if you want to talk about something that is impractical, you're going to love our last entry, and we're talking about the 22 tuba. Now, sadly, he didn't actually take a tuba and make a cartridge. That would have been really cool. But yeah. I kind of feel like this origin story is something similar to basically two frat brothers sitting around at a party, getting hammered and saying, hey, dude, wouldn't it be cool if we did X, Y, or Z? Then you grab a pen, you scribble it down on some paper, and then you wake up the next day hungover and you don't do it. However... Zachary Wayman uh, is the gentleman who made the 22 tuba, and it did come about by a friend saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? 
And this is a reference to what was referred to as a dingbat cartridge. Now, that in and of itself is an amazing name. Uh, but basically, these were like cartridges that couldn't ever exist, like something out, outlandish out of a comic book. Uh, but his friend's like, hey, why don't we make something like that? And so Wayman, not being one to back down from a challenge, decided to go ahead and do it. Basically, he made, of course, two versions. We have the rimless and the rimmed version, but he made them by basically reforming a piece of 44 Magnum or a 45 ACP. Now, the 44 Mag was the rimmed version and the 45 ACP is the rimless version. And he basically necked them down and made them conical to accept a 22 caliber bullet, like what you'd shoot out of an AR-15. He made the 22 tuba two, version 2.0, uh, and he actually fired this thing. A really interesting novelty cartridge that basically seems like it came about on a dare. Chris, I feel like we got to do the 22 year split in Loud and Boomer versus the 22 Tuba podcast pretty soon. I mean, maybe we can make that happen. I mean, if we can get these folks to make us some of these rounds, I would totally do it. Uh, but uh, guys, that is our top eight wildest cartridges that uh, Dave and I could come up with. If there's something even more outlandish that you've heard of, make sure you leave it down in the comments. Do all the youtube -y stuff for us. Click that like and subscribe button. Join the channel. Make sure you get updated every time you get new videos uploaded here on the ammo.com YouTube channel. And we'll see you out on the range. <laughs>